TDT is proud to present the TDT Talks webinar series. This is a series is a way for us to give back to the community by providing a forum for researchers in this time of COVID and uncertainty. Uh, this series is focused on sleep research. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Doley from the University of Iowa is our second presenter in TDT Talks sleep webinar series. Jimmy is a scientist who has studied two of Nico Tinbergen's four questions. He started his career as a PhD student in Dr. Lee Kravitzer's lab, where he studied the evolutionary origins of primary somatosensory and primary motor cortex. He is now studying the ontogeny and development of sensory motor systems and how motor control changes through ontogeny, and how these changes are associated with age-appropriate development and refinement. In his spare time, he is applying for jobs, grants, and enjoying the new normal, social distancing with his girlfriend, Michaela, and his two dogs, Zelda and Stella. His talk today is titled, Myoclonic Twitches During REM Sleep During <laughs> Drive Neural Activity in Motor Thalamus and Motor Cortex in Pre-Weanling Rats. And now I'm gonna pass this off to him so that he can uh, conf continue on. Jimmy? Uh, all yours. And show my screen. Okay, and is, is it showing the right screen and can people hear me? Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, that introduction and for this opportunity and for everyone who took time out of spending time at their home to uh, listen to me talk about uh, REM sleep twitches and motor cortex and motor thalamus. Um, and my talk, as mentioned, is titled Myoclonic Twitches During REM Sleep Drive Neural Activity in Motor Thalamus and Motor Cortex in pre weanling Rats. So I study the sensory motor system, and this you'll see uh, a man on a bicycle perform this amazing feat, which is just meant to demonstrate that our sensory motor systems can accomplish some miraculous tasks. Uh, this guy is jumping over a canal using sensory information, visual inputs, you know, feedback from his sensory system to do something that I think most of us would agree we would think would be impossible. But this actually isn't what I study. I don't study experts performing at their best. I study uh, sensory environments more like this little toddler here grabbing a scoop of ice cream. Um, it's a lot less coordinated. It's a lot less precise. I don't think anyone would argue this toddler is an expert at eating ice cream. Um, but what I think is actually interesting is that a lot more people study experts performing these expert complicated movements than babies who make these relatively simple movements. Um, and because of that, and because I think we can learn a lot about how these systems develop, I generally focus my research on young animals, like that toddler eating that ice cream. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we know about what we know about movements and pr movement production in adults. So when we're talking about movements, generally in mammals, we're talking about a structure called primary motor cortex. So this is a human brain uh, looking at it from the side, all this wrinkly stuff on top is the neocortex and primary motor cortex is this part here in red. Um, and if we take a slice through the neocortex, we can see the general what's called the somatotopic organization of primary motor cortex. And it's laid out in a pretty logical way where adjacent parts of the body are represented by adjacent parts of cortex. So you have the face, the hand, arms, body, leg, and toes, where neurons in each one of these different areas, these different regions of primary motor cortex control movements of that associated part of the body. So say I'm a human, I am, and I want to move my hand. A neuron in primary motor cortex in the hand representation would send a command down the spinal cord, which would cause my hand to move, and that movement would be executed. And this isn't just the way this works in humans. It actually also works this way in rats and a lot of different mammals, where this is a rat brain now. This is the olfactory balls, which are way out in the front. You'd imagine the spinal cord would extend out here. And then this big round area here, that's that rat's neocortex. And the red spot, just like in this human brain, is primary motor cortex. And it has the same type of a synaptic organization where you have face, jaw, forelimb, and hind limb. And so if this rat wanted to move its, its forelimb or its hand, the neurons in 
primary motor cortex of this rat would send a command down the spinal cord and it would move its hand. And that's the way it works in a very simplified way in mammals. But what does it mean when we say that motor cortex produces movement? The way this was originally discovered and kind of originally thought of is via experimentation. So if you electrically stimulate M1 by, you know, literally putting electricity into the neurons, uh, in this case, by stimulating the forelimb representation of this rat's brain, you can produce a forelimb movement. Um, but that's kind of a very specific definition. It isn't the way it works, you know, generally, we're not normally going around getting shocked in order to produce movements. And so there's a broader definition that we can use as well, which is to say that neurons in M1 that show an increase in activity before a movement is made, we could classify as motor neurons. And so this is more looking at the relationship between a movement and activity itself. And so if neural activity generally precedes movement, then you could say that that neuron is representing a motor command for that movement. And we can look at the opposite of that as well. And we can say that if neural activity generally follows movement, then in all likelihood that neuron is representing a sensory response or the sensory feedback from that movement and it isn't executing that movement. And there's a third category that we can talk about, um, which we'll get into a little bit later, which is what happens if the neural activity actually co-occurs or occurs at the same time as the movement. And that would be an example of that neuron representing a motor copy or kind of an internal representation of a motor command. And I'll get into more what that means and what that can represent later in the talk. But these would be the three general classes of how neural activity can relate to movements. And I think something that's important is that M1 actually doesn't produce, even in adults, even in the bicyclist that showed you, M1 doesn't produce these movements in isolation. Um, so of course, motor cortex, in adult animals can send one of these commands down to the forelimb and produce a forelimb movement, but it's not the only structure that can do so. If you're talking about the limb system, there's another structure called the red nucleus, which is in the midbrain, I've illustrated it here in red, um, that can also send motor commands and produce limb movements. So M1 is not the only motor structure and it doesn't ever operate purely in isolation. And the reason I bring this up is because it's pretty important developmentally. So in early development, M1 actually isn't responsible for producing any movement. This is true for the first few postnatal weeks in rats. It's probably true for the first couple of postnatal months in humans where motor cortex actually can't initiate motor commands. And instead, it's that same structure, the red nucleus with the case in the case of limb movements that can send motor commands down and produce movements of the limbs. But that doesn't mean that motor cortex is just sitting there silently. Actually, sensory feedback from those limb movements can go through the brain, starting in the medulla in a structure called the external cuneate nucleus, goes to thalamus, and then to motor cortex. And I've colored motor cortex green here, and I've drawn this entire sensory feedback pathway green because at these early ages, motor cortex, despite its name, functions a lot more like a sensory area. So motor cortex is not executing these movements, but receiving and processing sensory feedback from early movements. And because of this, I'm, uh, I'm starting to call the first phase of M1's development, which I'm gonna say occurs in three general phases, the sensory phase. And this is a phase where activity in M1 represents movements that have already happened, not movements that are going to happen or movements that are currently happening. And this, in rats, motor cortex exists for the first probably at least three postnatal weeks. And it starts in phase two, which is the motor copy phase. And that's when activity in M1 can start to represent movements that are currently happening. And then finally, after the completion of this, motor cortex enters what I think I would call phase three, which is what most people study when motor activity in motor cortex represents movements that are going to happen. And M1 is actually involved in the production of those movements. And so for this talk, I'm going to talk about the first two of these phases. I'm going to spend the majority of the talk talking about the earliest activity in motor cortex and the sensory phase. And then towards the end, I'm going to talk about the motor copy phase. So uh, primary motor cortex, the earliest sensory phase. Um, this is a period of time in motor cortex's development when M1 processes sensory feedback from movements and that the sensory feedback promotes experience-dependent plasticity in M1. 
And importantly, not all movements produce the same response and not all movements can equally drive activity in primary motor cortex across this developmental phase. And when I say all movements, I'm gonna divide movements into two broad categories, one of which I know everyone in the audience will be familiar with. So these are wake movements and myoclonic twitches. Um, wake movements are probably what everyone here was thinking about when I would talk about self-generated movements. This is one of the dogs I'm social distancing with, doing a brilliant job demonstrating a wake movement as he jumps off of this dock. These are long coordinated movements, some people might argue they're goal directed. They involve multiple parts of the body and occur over time course of several seconds. And all of this is to contrast them from my clone twitches, which anyone who has a pet or has spent time looking at animal sleeping, I'm sure has seen. These are movements of the skeletal muscles. I think most people would argue they're not goal directed. They're incredibly brief. So you can see my dog here with all of these limb twitches. And uh, while there might be some general patterning, they appear to be kind of occurring at random across this animal's body. And not surprisingly, this is how I'm dividing these movements uh, across the sensory phase of M1's development, M1's response to twitches and wake movements can change dramatically. So I am going to be talking about experiments that I've done in rats. And this first experiment is conducted in rats between the ages of P8 and P12. So I have a photograph of a P8 rat meeting a P12 rat here, just so you guys can see approximately when in rat development we are. <laughs> Um, both of these ages, the animals are definitely very much immature. Their eyes haven't yet opened. That occurs at about P15. Um, at P8, they have very little fur. They're starting to get a little bit more fur at P12. But I think everyone would agree across this entire time period from P8 to P12, these animals are not ready to be out on their own. They're dependent on their mother and they're very much still developing organisms. And for these experiments, if I can get into the methods of them a little bit, I'm going to be recording in primary motor cortex and particularly the forelimb representation of primary motor cortex. So this is the rat brain here. This is a diagram of an electrode. It's in this forelimb representation of primary motor cortex. And while I'm doing these recordings, the animal is going to be head fixed. So its head is stationary. That helps with the recording. And it's gonna be supported by a platform. It's gonna be in an environment with the right temperature and the right humidity to where it's comfortable, its position will be comfortable for it. And when you put infant rats in this kind of an environment, they actually readily sleep. Um, so they'll cycle between sleep and wake. Its limbs are dangling freely, and you can see even if it moves its limbs via twitches or via wake movements, it's not likely to hit anything. And so all of the sensory feedback that we're getting should be from the limb movements themselves. So while I'm doing this, I'm recording video of the animal and I'm actually also recording neurophysiological data in the case of primary motor cortex and some behavioral data in the case of uh, EMG electromyographic recordings. In this experiment, I'm gonna have two EMGs, one of the nuchal muscle of the neck and one of the forelimb. And we use these EMGs to determine the behavioral state or sleep-wake state of the animal. So REM sleep or active sleep, as we call it in these infant rats, uh, one of, one of the characteristics of it is what's called muscle atonia or a lack of muscle tone. So if you've ever been at a lecture, back when we would go to lectures in person, and would start to get tired and you'd notice your head bobbing, that's the atonia of sleep that's stopping your head from being supported by what would be your nuchal muscle. And so we can see that in this EMG record by a very, very small line for the first half of this record, which is the period of active sleep. And then once the animal wakes up, you see a lot more muscle tone uh, towards the second half. Now, there is some muscular activity, particularly in this forelimb EMG, that is these spikes, and those would be the myoclonic twitches that we see during active sleep. So we can take this record, we can categorize it into active sleep and wake, which I've done here. So you can see first half, this is a typical EMG record during active sleep. Second half, these larger movements in this chronic tone indicative of wake. And we can also use these EMG records to actually classify limb movements and characterize when limb movements occur. And so in this case, for the first half of this record, the phone is moving when each one of these tick marks appears, and that would be a twitch 
and the second half of this record where you have these red tick marks, these are wake movements, which you can see from this muscle activity are much longer, possibly larger in magnitude, and also occurring in this record. And so finally, as I started talking about my methods, I was also recording unit activity in the forelimb representation of primary motor cortex in these animals. And so you can see each one of these is tick marked as a uh, action potential of an individual single unit. And in this animal, I recorded several units and you can see how the unit activity relates to these forelimb movements and this muscle activity. And so it's a little bit difficult to tell here, but maybe you, I can convince you that when you get these forelimb movements during active sleep, you get a lot of bursts of activity in primary motor cortex. But rather than force you to read literally between the lines here, what I can do is I can look at the representative unit activity of individual neurons in primary motor cortex relative to each twitch or each wave movement that occurs. And that's what I'm going to be showing you next. So here we have a representative M1 neuron of an eight-day-old or P8 animal and its response to twitches. So these are twitches generated by active sleep. This is a single neuron. Each one of these lines here represents the activity of that neuron in the second half second before to the half second after uh, a twitch. Um, and one of the first things you'll see is that there's this big burst of activity occurring after zero, so following each one of these twitches. So this neuron, I think we would say, is very twitch responsive. And this is a neuron in the forelimb representation of primary motor cortex. Now, if we look at the same neuron's activity to wake movements, you can see that first, in general, there's a lot less activity during wake, but there's little, if any, increase in activity in this neuron following wake movements. You can see maybe a couple of instances where you get some action potentials and a little blip, but definitely nothing like this neuron was responding to twitches. So at P8, we appear to see lots of twitch responsiveness and very little wake movement responses, responsiveness. So how about P12? Well, again, this is the neural activity of an individual neuron in primary motor cortex following a twitch, and you can see a burst of activity. Um, and if we look at the same neuron in response to wake movements, now you can see there's actually a lot more activity following these wake movements. So what this says from these two, at least these two example neurons, is that at P8, motor cortex responds strongly to twitches, but not very strongly to wake movements. And at P12, it appears to be responding to both of these. Um, and what does it look like if we look at all the data in summary? So now this is going to be across a couple hundred neurons. At P8, we see a similar story, a strong twitch response and a weaker wake movement response. And at P12, now we have a continued strong twitch response, but now relatively speaking, a much stronger wake response. But when you think about it, this is a little bit confusing because when I showed you at least examples of my dog twitching and my dog having wake movements, wake movements are longer, uh, they involve a, uh, more of the body, they're of larger amplitude. And so the notion that wake movements early in development would produce a weaker response is a bit confusing when you actually look at the movements themselves. And it motivates a question of, is this activity being inhibited or specifically where in the brain does the early inhibition of sensory feedback from wave movements take place? So if you remember earlier, uh, I went through the pathway that uh, we see uh, both wake movements actually and twitches occurring in the infant brain where the red nucleus sends a command to the limb and you get sensory feedback from that command going between the uh, across the brain. And so what we did when we had this question is we looked at the first stop of sensory information in the brain in the external cuneate nucleus and saw whether the activity there looks similar to the activity that we see in primary motor cortex to get an idea of where this wake related activity could be being inhibited. So we did a follow up experiment where just like in the previous one, we were recording neural activity in this case in the external cuneate nucleus. Um, exact same experimental setup, just we're recording in a different area, and we get the same EMG data, uh, which you can see here. We classified it as active sleep and wake, which I've done again here. Classify the movements, look at the unit activity in the ECN, and relate this unit activity back to the movements themselves. And so just as I did in primary motor cortex, I can show you a representative neuron at P8. The ECN responds strongly to twitches, which you can see right here, um, and actually doesn't really respond at all 
to weight movements. So you don't see much of a response to weight movements of P8. And it's actually, that's similar to what we saw in motor cortex. At P12, again, you see a decent uh, twitch response in the E10. And just like we saw in motor cortex at P12, now we do see a response in the ECN to wake movements. So this is a very similar story in the first stage of sensory processing that we saw in primary motor cortex. And this gives us an idea of where, at least the first location where this wake-related inhibition could be taking place at P8. So to kind of summarize these early results, at P8, twitch response, uh, the sensory feedback from twitches goes across the entire brain. <laughs> Whereas for wake movements, it's inhibited at the ECN where you get a diminished wake response. And at P12, the, the sensory responses from twitches and wake movements brain to where both the ECN and primary motor cortex are responding to twitches at the, this age. So if we go back to the summary of rats, we can say that M1 responds to twitches and M1, uh, or if we could say M1 responds to twitches, actually starting the earliest age where we've done function recordings about P, uh, postnatal day four, but definitely from P8 to P12, we see this robust twitch responsiveness. But it starts responding to wake movement just before P12 and about P11, that's when we start to see these stronger wake movement responses. But obviously development doesn't stop at 12 days of age. As I showed you, these animals are, you know, immature, their eyes haven't opened, and so there's a question of whether these responses continue at later ages of development. So here I've drawn, uh, or I've, I've illustrated a 20 day old rat, which you can see here. Now this looks a lot more, I would say like a juvenile rat. Its eyes are open in this particular photograph. He's reared up. Uh, it looks like, you know, they're exploring. They're a little bit more independent. Um, this would be about the age, approximately the age when rats uh, in experimental colonies are weaned around P20. And we know that M1 continues to respond to wake movements through this period and actually into adulthood. You can see sensory feedback from wake movements in even adult primary motor cortex. But unfortunately, because our lab is one of the few that studies twitches, although there are more all the time, our methods make it very difficult to actually look at twitch-related activity much beyond P12. And that's because we use this pup being supported by a platform where its limbs are dangling freely, which does fine really from birth through P12 or P13, but after that they really want to have their limbs being supported by something. And what that means is if we put them in the same configuration, they won't like it, they won't be comfortable, and so they won't sleep. So we needed some methodological innovation in order to be able to study twitch-related activity at later ages. And a couple of years ago, when at uh, SFN, actually, we saw this device called the Mobile Home Gauge, which is designed for adult mice, but we were able to modify to work with, uh, with developing rats. And the way it basically works is it is an air table that is constantly blowing air up from all of these little holes, and you have a rat in an enclosure, and because the air is blowing up on this enclosure, it is very, very light nearly weightless. And so as the rat whose paws are touching the bottom of the enclosure moves around, it can virtually move, the, it can move the enclosure around itself, simulating movement. And so because of this, uh, the animal is much more comfortable because it feels like it can move even though it's still head fixed. And so as a result, we're able to get the animal in an acute prep from P12 to P20 to readily sleep on the same day of habituation and study twitch-related and active sleep-related activity in these ages that we couldn't have done so before. So we use this new device to really answer that question about whether this twitch responsiveness persists beyond P12. And so in this experiment, I'm recording neural activity in rats. Uh, I'm gonna show you activity today during active sleep from P at P12, at P16, and at P20. So, this data is actually very similar to the data I showed you earlier. Um, this time I'm only going to have nuchal EMG, but you can read this nuchal EMG the same way as you did in the early experiment where you have atonia. This is a period of active sleep and these brief tick marks are twitches. These would be nuchal or neck muscle twitches. But instead of actually recording uh, muscle activity in the forelimb to trigger twitches, I'm doing what I'm going to call here a movement analysis. And that's basically 
I was recording high-speed video that's perfectly synchronized to the electrophysiological data. And what I can do is look at pixel over pixel change. So this camera footage was recorded at 100 frames per second. And I can look at from frame one to frame two, how many pixels change, quantify that from frame two to frame three, how many pixels change and create a plot of how much movement is occurring in the camera frame. And we can use this movement as a way of detecting whether or not the end is twitching. And it's a bit more labor intensive than just using EMGs as triggers. But what this allows me to do is characterize twitches anywhere I can see the actual animal in the recording. And so instead of just recording forelimb twitches, I actually recorded twitches of the forelimb, hindlimb, whiskers, and tail in these experiments. And so you can see a sleeping P20 rat here, uh, color coded for how I recorded these or how I coded these twitches. And in this record, there's a good number of forelimb twitches in this P12 animal, some hindlimb twitches, some whisker twitches, and some tail twitches. And as I was doing earlier, I also recorded M1 activity. And so this is the first hint. I've already showed you P12 data in the previous experiment, but you can see around when these twitches occur, you do see bursts of increased in act activity in the forelimb representation of primary motor cortex. So in this new prep, it also superficially looks like we are getting twitch-related activity. And so as I mentioned earlier, I did this at P12, at P16, and at P20. Uh, I was able to get uh, a seven different number of twitches, over 100 twitches in several animals, um, or over 100 forelimb twitches in several animals, um, so that I can characterize whether or not motor cortex is responding to these active sleep twitches. And so you can see a representative distribution of twitches at P16 and P20. This is 15 seconds of active sleep at all three stages. So rather than show you individual neurons, I'm just going to take the overall summary data and get right to it. Um, this is now the mean twitch response in, uh, of these motor cortex uh, neurons in the forelimb representation of the cortex. And at peak level, not surprisingly, they do show a pretty robust response to twitches. Um, just to note, I've z-scored these data. So this is the mean neural response as a z-score. So zero would be the baseline activity, and this is standard deviations above the baseline. You can see 41 neurons, a fairly robust twitch response. So how about P16? So now this is 135 neurons. It looks like you have a little bit of a refined response where it doesn't persist for quite as long, but you do continue to see responses in primary motor cortex to forelimb twitches at P16. And then likewise for P20. Now there's 50 neurons here. You can see perhaps continued refinement, but you still do see twitch-driven activity in primary motor cortex in relation to a forelimb twitch. And I mentioned that I scored twitches across the entire body. Um, so I just want to show that these responses in the forelimb representation of primary motor cortex actually are quite somatotopically refined. So I can take these same neurons and look at how they respond to tiny limb twitches, which is what I've drawn here. And you can see there's no increase in their activity uh, uh, when a hind limb twitch occurs. And it's the same for whisker twitches, and it's the same for tail twitches. And so what this tells us is that P12 to P20, motor cortex continues to have twitch-related activity, and that twitch-related activity is, shows very precise somatotopy to where these neurons respond to forelimb twitches, but not twitches of other parts of the body. So that lets us fill in this plot where we see M1 activity related to twitches from the earliest stage through the latest stages that we've tested so far, um, and we see response from wake points from P12. I have it also in P20, and other people have documented it, and even for that into adulthood. But what I want to do next is I want to kind of start to enter the next phase, and I want to really start to more critically examine this twitch-related activity in primary motor cortex. And so I'm going to take these same responses, and I'm going to zoom in on them and say, see how much they look like sensory responses versus possibly something else. And before I do that, I'm going to formally now enter the second part of this talk where motor cortex is possibly entering phase two, the motor P phase. And that's when M1 activity represents movements that are currently happening instead of the, just the sensory consequences of those movements. So M1 phase two, the motor copy phase. Um, in this phase, M1, I believe is, and I hope to demonstrate to you, is receiving a motor copy of subject cortically generated motor commands. In the case of the forelimb system, those would be motor commands probably generated by the red nucleus. 
And that this provides M1 with access to motor commands as they're executed instead of just afterwards, which is going to be important for ultimately sensory motor integration and M1 asserting motor control on its own. So I'm going to go back to the methods of that experiment and focus on this movement analysis that I talked about earlier, where I'm looking at pixel over pixel changes in the video. Because I, what I can do is I can use this and the fact that I was collecting this video at 100 frames per second to get 10 millisecond bins, that's each frame, of whether movement was occurring. And I can trigger this curve here on Twitches and get kind of the average duration of a four-limb Twitch, which is what I've plotted here. So you can see this is for a P12 animal. Uh, I trigger these four-limb Twitches at the first frame where I see movement. So you can see at the zero point here, um, if this is a plot of how much frame over frame change, how much movement is occurring in the camera, you can see that I trigger it when this is starting to go up. And the movement persists for about 30 milliseconds, uh, and that's peak displacement. That's when the limb is the furthest from its origin point, and then it returns back to baseline. And so you can think of this as like a plot of how uh, the duration of the movement and how long the movement is lasting. And what we can do is we can look at this twitch average response and relate it to the neural activity that we see. And we can use this chart that I showed you guys earlier to say, what does this neural activity look like? And so if it were motor activity, you would imagine, I've drawn it red here to match this color code, the neural activity would be preceding the movement itself. And that would be indicative that there's a motor command being sent, there's some conduction velocity as it goes you know, from the neuron that's, that executed that command to the muscle itself, but that that neuron is executing motor commands. You could imagine if the neural activity was timed at the same time as the movement, that would be this middle, um, uh, this motor copy category, where it's an internal representation of the movement. And you could imagine if the neural activity occurs after the movement, that it is indicative of a sensory response, so that it's sensory feedback from that movement. So if we take a look at the neural activity and we zoom in on it, we're looking at a half second before and a half second after the movement. Um, that's what I've done here. So you can see we're going to take this P12 and really just expand it out. Uh, I color it black now, but this is the exact same curve, uh, just with a uh, zoom down it much more. And we compare that to the time course of the movement itself, and we look at this plot. You can see that the majority of activity and really, and really even the peak of the activity in primary motor cortex does seem to occur at, in a P12 animal a bit after the twitch has ended. So this is, to me, indicative more of a sensory response. This is a delayed response. Uh, uh, the neural activity is delayed relative to the time course of the movement. And if we do this for a P16 animal, this is again primary motor cortex, you can see delayed peak. Most of the activity occurs after the end of the movement. And this is, again, consistent with a sensory response to this movement. But when we go to P20, now I can start to see that it might be a little bit harder for me to convince myself that this is purely a sensory response. For one thing, the activity of the neurons in motor cortex peaks at the same time as the peak displacement of the twitch occurs. And it doesn't last nearly as long after the movement. This is starting to look a lot more like this blue category than this green category at P20. So that maybe would make me suspicious that motor cortex is now acting more like it's receiving a motor copy than sensory feedback of this information. But that opens up a question. How would M1 be getting a motor copy? So the most likely pathway here is actually from a branching axon from the red nucleus that after making a brief stop goes to the cerebellum and then also from the cerebellum projects the thalamus and that projects strongly to primary motor cortex. And so now that I have two thalamic nuclei, I'll label them independent individually and say that you have sensory information in the thalamus going through the ventral posterior nucleus, and you have potentially a motor copy or cerebellar output in the thalamus going to the ventral lateral nucleus. And that both of these nucleus could be prevent, potentially providing information to primary motor cortex, just a different type of information. And so in order to assess this, in this experiment that I was uh, talking about earlier, I didn't just record neural activity in primary motor cortex, but I also recorded neural activity in both VP and VL, so these different thalamic nuclei, in order to see how that activity 
also related to the time course of these switches. So I'll walk through what some representative data looks like in these neurons. Uh, first, I'll start with VP. So this is doing neural recordings in VP using the mobile home cage, identical methods to what I showed you before, except instead now I'm recording in the ventral posterior nucleus. Um, and first, I want to show you that as in the case, as the case with primary motor cortex, if we look at all these different parts of the body, in this case, this is a tail responsive neuron, but these neurons in the ventral posterior nucleus show highly refined somatotopy. I think this is in a P12 animal, and they respond very strongly to twitches. So you can see in this particular neuron, not any response to forelimb twitches, not any response to hindlimb twitches, not any response to whisker twitches, but a very strong and very sharp response to tail twitches. So I just want to check that box and let it be known that this was the case at P12, P16, and P20, that the ventral posterior nucleus does respond in a somatotropically restricted way to twitches. But now I want to look at some representative neurons uh, and how the timing of that response relates to the movement itself. So here, this is the same kind of a raster plot as I showed you earlier, um, where each one of these sweeps is a uh, individual trial, and each one of these tick marks is when that VP neuron was active. This is a P12 neuron, and in gray here, I have the average displacement produced by these twitches, so the pattern of movement. And what you can see is that you do see a delay between when the peak of the vent of these VP neurons, the peak VP neuron activity, I guess, and the movement itself. And you see that at P12, you see that in P16. In this particular neuron, it's actually even more of a delay. And you see that at P20, to where the time course of activity looks very similar to the twitch itself in terms of its duration, but it's delayed by about 20 to 30 milliseconds. And that's what we see when we look at the summary data. So this is in this case, I think it's about 100, 150 neurons, P12, P16, and P20 in VP, where 20 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds peak activity from these neurons versus when you get peak movement. And that's a delay in VP that's actually consistent with what people find in adults in response to sensory stimulation. And this is consistent with the amount of time you would expect sensory responses to get back to uh, thalamus from the periphery. So that confirms what scientists have believed for decades, that VP does appear to be predominantly processing sensory responses and it's doing this for twitches just as it would do for other types of sensory responses. So that's good for VP. Now let's move on to VL, which if you remember received input from the cerebellum, which potentially could uh, hold one of these motor copy signals and be providing that to, uh, to cortex. So here is a VL neuron at P12. And again, we see you know, the, the displacement from the twitch and the delayed response uh, of neural activity. Uh, here it is at P16, and it's a similar story to what we saw in VP, where you have a pretty sharp peak, but it's delayed by about 20 milliseconds. And then when we go to P20, now suddenly you see that you don't get as much of a delay. Uh, if anything, you don't seem like you see much of a delay at all. And this is just in one neuron. But if we look at all of the data in VL in aggregate, and this is again going to be about 100, 150 neurons in different ages, you see that you have about a 20 millisecond delay between the peak neural activity and the peak displacement of the movement at P12 and P16. But in aggregate, across all of the neurons that were twitch responsive, I don't see any delay in terms of the time of uh, the, uh, the peak movement or the peak displacement and the peak neural activity. So if we compare now VL activity to VP activity on the same plot, I've plotted them here in blue and green. You can see that VL and VP together show a delayed response at P12 and a delayed response at P16, and these delays are similar. But at P20, now the populations appear to have diverged, where VP is still showing a pretty consistent sensory response, a delayed response relative to the movement itself. But VL actually is now timed quite well with the movement, indicative more of a motor copy, and definitely not leaving it enough of a delay to be indicative of a sensory response.
So this leaves us to the situation where at P20, the Twitch-related activity in VL is faster than VP. And because we believe that VP should be the fastest sensory response in thalamus, it strongly suggests that VL represents a motor copy and not a sensory response. But if you're like me, this probably makes you suspicious about what was going on in VL across all of these different ages. And to put this a bit more precisely, if we go back and look at this plot, you can see that there's this shoulder in VL at all three of these ages where the activity actually starts picking up earlier in VL than VP. So if we're not focused on the peaks and we're focused on just when does activity start to increase, even at P12, you see activity starting to increase before, you know, the movement has peaked. And, you know, I guess it's, it's a broader peak and it's increasing earlier in VL than VP at all of these different ages, which suggests that maybe what we're seeing in VL isn't necessarily a sensory response this entire time. And so I'm going to just focus on P12 here and just put a couple of hypotheses. Uh, possibility one is that at P12, the cerebellum is not providing VL and M1 with a motor copy. And so what we're seeing at this early age is just in VL and M1 potentially is sensory feedback. But possibility two is that at P12, the cerebellum is providing VL with a motor copy, but it's just poorly timed to where the cerebellar output is slow itself. And so it doesn't look like a precisely timed motor copy just because the system is immature and not timed properly. So a future direction that I'm working on right now is to investigate if the cerebellum is the source of this motor copy to VL and M1, if I inactivate the cerebellum, I should be able to remove any motor copy coming from the cerebellum and isolate in VL and M1 what is the sensory component of this twitch response and potentially remove what is the motor copy. And so those are experiments that I'm doing right now. But regardless, now we can say, if we take all this information together, that M we see M1 activity related to twitches across this entire period. And early on, we believe it's a purely sensory response, but by P20, it looks like the activity, at least in VL, is more of a motor copy. But we don't know when and how this transformation of twitch-related activity in primary motor cortex occurs. It could occur earlier or it could occur later, which I'm diagramming here by a change in this uh, uh, sliding scale. And the activity that I'm going to be looking at in the cerebellum and what the cerebellum is contributing to activity in BLNM1 will hopefully remove some of the ambiguity of what of this activity is sensory and what of this activity represents potentially a poorly timed motor copy from the cerebellum. So now, general conclusions. Um, Throughout this early sensory phase, self-generated movements can differentially drive activity in M1, and that's the case with twitches and wake movements across development. Uh, these self-generated movements continue to drive activity in thalamus and M1 at all the ages we've tested so far, so through at least P20. We don't have any reason to believe that suddenly the twitch responsiveness or the twitch-related activity is going to drop off at that age, and we haven't seen any evidence of that. By P20, M1 appears to be receiving a motor copy of the subcortical motor commands that's presumably coming from the cerebellum, but stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. And through at least P20, there's no evidence of motor outflow in M1. And that's just the one thing, if there's one thing you take from this that I want you to take away, which is that motor cortex does not appear to be motor mm -hmm. through at least P20 in rats. It is starting to receive a, a motor copy and it's received processing sensory feedback, but it's not a motor structure through this age. And when it becomes one, just stay tuned and hopefully I'll have an answer to that in the coming years. So with that, I'd love to thank the lab. This is how I know them now via Zoom. Most of the people are here. Apparently I was talking when the screenshot was taken. Um, and especially I'd like to thank Mark Lumberg, Greta Sokoloff, and the graduate students in the lab, Lex Gomez, Ryan Glanz, and Kevin Yu. And with that, I would open it up to any questions. Hi all. So, um... This is Victor, I'm back online. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into uh, the question um, section of the webinar and we can uh, start answering them. Oh, we already have one. So uh, we have one that says, do self-generated movements drive activity in S1? And does it make sense to record simultaneously in 
M1 and S1. So, so it absolutely on. does. It absolutely yeah. does make sense to record simultaneously in M1 and S1, and that's actually the project of a graduate student in the lab right now. Um, both S1 and M1 do respond to self-generated movements, um, and we just submitted a publication that uh, Lex Gomez, the graduate student in the lab who's working on that project, is the lead author on, that kind of goes through differences between P8 and P12 in the way that sensory signals are processed by those two structures. And the, the biggest takeaway, and Lex is the expert on this, and so I would encourage you to email her if you have specific questions. But the biggest takeaway is that at P8, both M1 and S1 seem to, seem to be receiving direct sensory information regarding all of the different submodalities in the somatosensory system, so that's tactile and proprioceptive. <laughs> Um, but by P12, you're starting to see cortical cortical communication and more dependence on M1 for tactile information, but not necessarily proprioceptive. But self-generated movements, so uh, the proprioceptive feedback from movements themselves appears to reach both structures uh, nearly simultaneously. Uh, this one is from Jacob Odahal. It is, um, uh, how long postnatally in rats does M1 not produce movements in early development? So the details of that depend on kind of the methods that are being used to establish what constitutes, you know, M1 producing movement. Um, I'm going to say, obviously, if you are allow yourself to apply unlimited current to the brain, at some point in time, you will produce a movement. Uh, just because, quite honestly, you're driving so many pulses through the brain that you're contracting muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on where researchers kind of set the threshold when they do electrical or optogenetic stimulation mm -hmm. um, of neurons to say, okay, yeah, that's sufficient to produce movement. Some have found it as early as P10 or potentially P13, especially if you do a pharmacological manipulation to disinhibit cortex. But some of the best work that I've seen suggests that if you want to use adult-like stimulation parameters, it's not until P35 that you can see, you know, normal intracortical stimulation of cortex driving movements in primary motor cortex. So that's pretty late. Uh, in terms of when in vivo you actually start to see neural activity in motor cortex preceding movements, no one's actually conducted that experiment in an unanesthetized animal. And that's something that I'm hoping to do. So, like I said, there's different ways you can classify M1 producing movement in terms of electrical stimulation, relatively late, P35, unless you want to drive more current into the brain. Um, and in vivo, we don't know, but I'm guessing it'll be somewhere in the in the 20s. I'm going to assume that this has answered Jacob's question about epileptic discharges in early development, where they can elicit P10 discharges by electrical stimulation of M1. Um, if Jacob wants to uh, send another message, please do. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Preston Donaldson, who wants, he says, I think human fetuses generate twitches in utero that are thought to help refine cortical somatotopy. So do you think the twitches you study in postnatal rats are analogous to human fetus twitches? And are they helpful in refining cortical uh, somatotopy? So I'm going to say absolutely yes. Uh, the ages that I'm looking at these rats, particularly through P12, I'm sure that these movements are very analogous to the ones that happen in utero in humans. And uh, the, the problem we, we face with these rats is that it's actually very difficult to selectively turn off twitching. They have a very strong sleep drive. And they use the same machinery, like I said, for the forelimb system, the red nucleus, to produce these twitches as they do to produce wake movements. So we haven't yet pinned down the perfect experiment where we've eliminated twitching and shown that that does not refine somatotopy. But what I can say is that from what we've seen, twitches drive the majority of neural activity. The brain in general, uh, cortex, is more active during sleep than it is during wake in these early ages. And so if there's any experience dependent or activity-dependent plasticity occurring, it's most likely predominantly driven by twitches. And so twitches are definitely the most likely candidate for helping refine the somatopathy. And so I would expect that these results from humans and rats to generalize 
And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but not yet that perfect causal experiment that would say that twitches are involved in refining somatotopy. Uh, this one is from Adela Selke. If I mispronounced her name, I apologize. How do M1 driven movements and non M1 driven movements differ behaviorally, especially in post weaning animals? And she says, what does M1 contribute to the behavior in these animals? So that is a question that actually probably has a lot of different species differences as well. Uh, in primates, that red nucleus system is thought to be a lot less important, especially for limb movements than M1 is. So the, diff the answer to that in rodents might be a bit different. Um, and there's a bunch of different theories. One that I... Yep, he froze again. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, because this is close to the end of the um, the talk, I suggest that everyone uh, please send their questions to Jimmy and hopefully he'll be able to respond. Um, I'm going to uh, thank again everyone for being at this talk. It was exciting and interesting. And uh, we hope that uh, the next webinar will be fun and error free. Thank you again, uh, Jimmy, and thank you again to all of our attendees. Uh, we will be back next week. Take care.